All right, let's uh, kick off this set review. I will probably be skipping most of the cards that I don't think have a strong likelihood of being constructed playable, at least in the sense that... Oh, cool. At least in the sense that um, we won't spend too long talking about them. Take, for example, Runic Shot. I'm kind of grappling with my own emotions here, because I said we were going to skip it, because I don't think it's playable, and yet I'm fighting with my desire to say why this card isn't good. So for the most part, we're just going to ignore what I said about ignoring things, and I'm going to stop and talk about cards that I don't think are good. Removal has historically, since at least when I started playing Magic, been less about how good the removal spell is as a way to exchange resources one for one, and more about how useful the removal is as a way to prevent your opponent from developing any kind of tempo advantage. Runic Shot is the kind of card that is very close to being efficient enough in terms of exchanging resources with your opponent in a way that advantages you on mana and creates a net equal exchange on card resources. It's a one-for-one -one exchange, but you generally are spending less mana than theirs. You can fit it in easy spots on the curve because it's only one mana, so you don't necessarily need to find... You don't have too much difficulty finding a spot to squeeze it in, and it increases the point at which you can start playing two spells a turn. It looks very similar to Portable Hole in that sense, except that in order to target a tapped creature, it has to be the turn after they've played their creature. It isn't instant. So basically, Runic Shot only ever kills like a one drop on turn three, or I guess a one drop on turn two if you're on the draw. And the fact that they got the ETB out of the creature, they already got an attack out of the creature, all of that just means I think you're generally going to be losing just way too much tempo development for this and modern magic doesn't have players running out of resources anywhere nearly as quickly these days so i just don't think you're really looking for effects that trade so poorly on tempo that's not really the point of magic we're at anymore so, despite somewhat potentially favorable comparisons for this card to Portable Hole, I don't think it's ultimately playable. I think that it would probably be closer to playable if the kicker gave it flash, but I still think it wouldn't be good enough to play at that point, and I think that the kicker existing basically doesn't really affect how playable this card is at all. It does make it stronger, just because it's a mana sink if you've got nothing better to do with your mana, and Scrying 2 is instantly some value but not very much. Let's see. Next playable-looking card we have is Destroy Evil. One in a white instant. Destroy target creature with toughness four or greater, or destroy target enchantment. I don't think this is a card that's necessarily going to automatically see play, but it is the kind of card that is worth keeping track of because if there's any kind of enchantments that you really want to destroy, there are certain metagames where this is a main deckable card. When Wilderness Reclamation was a popular effect, this kind of thing was something you started main decking. Or things like this were things that you would have main decked, and this was is a card that absolutely would have played in that format. So, something interesting to keep track of. I don't think that this is ever going to be something you proactively include in your deck, but... Useful to have on your brain. Going back one, Runic Shot seems sweet with the fairy who slows the sunrise in standard. Yeah. Runic Shot does... Like, it's got synergy if the fairy is tapping down your opponent's stuff. Okay, so I, the idea there is supposed to be then that you untap a land with Teferi, tap their creature, kill it with Runic Shot. That's not a bad synergy. I'm not sure that I want to be playing Teferi who slows the sunrise. The only problem I have with that is that that means you're also playing Runic Shot 
the entire time that you don't have Teferi who slows the sunset in play, and then it's bad at that point. And I generally, when building a control deck, want my removal to be able to do stuff on the first four turns. So, like, I don't know that Runic Shot is likely to replace, say, Faithfully Absent for me, just because instant speed is so valuable on the first couple of turns. To clarify this for anybody who might not realize why I harp on instant speed so much when it comes to building control decks, the advantage of instant speed isn't just that you get to wait and get more information. It also means uh, if my opponent plays a 3-drop on turn 3, the advantage of instant speed is I get to, on the draw for 2 mana with my turn 2, kill their 3-drop and trade up on tempo. Whereas a sorcery speed removal spell that did the same thing is never going to kill a turn draw, or never going to kill a 3-drop with your turn 2. Could only ever kill a 2-drop there's just a much higher likelihood that you can't actually do anything with your turn two if the only ever thing you can kill with your turn two sorcery removal on the play is a one drop that they're probably not going to play in standard. So I I'm generally not very high on sorcery speed removal. Even portable hole don't love, and I think this is just worse than portable hole. Although we're losing portable hole. It, although we are gaining a new 3-mana mass portable hole that we will cover later, that I'm curious to see how that plays out. But also, that card's really good with Faithfully Absent. So, like, you have a really strong incentive to play, like, four Faithful Absences in your deck. <laughs> Since it kills the clue token in addition to their creatures. Okay, next up... We talked about Destroy Evil, that it's interesting to keep track of. And then we have Guardian of New Banalia. One and a white for a 2-2 creature human soldier with Enlist, which is a new keyword that allows you to basically banding. So when Guardian of New Banalia or any other creature with Enlist attacks, you may tap basically creatures that could have also attacked with it, sort of. I guess that's not really a good example because you can tap, you can enlist defenders. You can tap a different creature that is not attacking, meaning vigilance doesn't stack twice. And if you do that, add its power to the enlisting creature until end of turn. So basically, if you have two Guardian of Benalias, one of them attacks and the other doesn't, you can tap the second Guardian of Benalia to turn the first Guardian of Benalia into a 4-2 until the end of turn. Not necessarily a way to, like, grant pseudo-haste to your new creatures. Whenever it enlists a creature, you get described to. And when you discard a card, it gains indestructible until end of turn and tap it. I don't believe this card is OP. I think this card's actually, like, probably weaker than the two previous versions of this sort of card we've seen before. Namely, uh, Seasoned Hollowblade and Adanto Vanguard. I'm sure there are some decks that want more of those effects. Uh, seasoned Hollow Blade saw play in some uh, Grease Fang decks as a discard outlet. Hypothetically, this now allows you to just play two-color Grease Fang if you wanted to. I don't know if you necessarily want to, but you could. The fact that this is only two power instead of three is a really big difference for the aggressive decks that are implicitly the decks that really want this kind of card. And I don't see Enlist as being a mechanic that increases the amount of damage this card, or the amount of clock that you're putting on the opponent. Now, admittedly, I'm not the kind of player who plays small ball creature mirrors, and Enlist seems like the kind of mechanic that is entirely designed around, I'm going to take my two tiny creatures and allow them to punch through your slightly bigger creature. And because I'm just not on decks that run into either side of those exchanges very much, that doesn't matter too much to me. But basically, this seems like a seasoned hollow blade that has two power instead of three. And I think that's potentially strong enough for standard play, especially post rotation. It's not like seasoned hollow blade is a bad spot to be starting, but. I don't expect it to see play in older formats because this reads to me as worse than Seasoned Hollow Blade. 
and definitely worse than Adanto Vanguard. At least for the purposes of being aggressive. All right. Following that, some limited cards. Could safely tap Magda or something like Amara. Yeah. I mean, I guess. But that's also really slow. That's like a tap outlet for Magda on turn four. If you're enlisting, which just like... You really want to be able to tap Magda, like, instantly. The second it comes into play. Knight of Dawn's Light. One in a white for a 2-2 creature human knight with first strike. If you would gain life, you gain that much life plus one instead. One in a white, Knight of Dawn's Light gets plus one plus one until end of turn. This doesn't do anything. <laughs> um, gaining that much life plus one doesn't really mean anything. I, I pulled this up because I had my brain kind of misidentify it. There's another card that untaps whenever you gain life from another set, and I thought this was like somehow a redundant combo piece for that, but it isn't. This, yeah, this mostly just is a limited card that I can't imagine doing anything other than possibly being Knight's Tribal, which maybe there's a Knight's Tribal thing that matters, but I kind of doubt it. And this has a lot of text and is an uncommon. Phyrexian Missionary, one in a white for a 2-3 creature Phyrexian Human Cleric. Okay, now this is a good spot to remember. We just had all party mechanics rotate out, right? I believe. I get the feeling like half of this stream is going to be me attempting to remember what cards and mechanics have all rotated out. Because I don't think... I don't think there's any party stuff left in Standard, but there is in Alchemy? Oh dear. Because Alchemy's gonna rotate at the same time as Standard, isn't it? Except that the Baldur's Gate stuff stays in? Okay. Maybe we don't bother trying to keep track of that. <laughs> anyway, this is a Cleric. Uh, it's got Kicker, one in a black has a lifelink, and when it enters the battlefield, if it was kicked, return target creature card from your graveyard to your hand. Uh, no, okay. So despite all that text, the ultimate result is not super interesting. It's two mana, two, three lifelinker. Sure, fine. It's got some card advantage if you staple two more mana onto it. This is the kind of card I love limited formats to be, like, determined by, because it's slow, grindy, defensive card advantage, but not a constructed anything, really. Is that Sarah's Realm? Presumably not, because I'm pretty sure Sarah's Realm is, like, super dead. Uh, let's see, Resolute Reinforcements, one and a white for a 1-1 one, one creature human soldier with flash. When it enters the battlefield, create a 1-1 one, one white soldier creature token. So this is Raise the Alarm, except doesn't have Raise the Alarm synergies with like, indomitable creativity? Doesn't seem like it does terribly much. So, moving on. Take up the shield. This one, I know, has got some interesting things going on. One in a white for an instant. Put a plus one plus one counter on target creature. It gains lifelink and indestructible until end of turn. This card. This card's interesting. And the reason that this card is interesting is specifically... That it combos with the card whose name I don't remember uh, from, I think it was Midnight Hunt, something Arsonist? No. Anyway, there's a four mana card that's like a 3-3 three, three, that whenever it takes damage, deals damage to a target equal to the amount of damage it took. Or if it's night, it makes it so that whenever any creature you control takes damage, deal that much damage to target. Interesting with Take Up the Shield, because you can give that 4-drop lifelink and indestructible, and then when it takes damage, if, say, your opponent blocked it and you do this in response, it does damage to itself, because itself is a valid target, and you gain life, because it's doing damage to itself and has lifelink, and it doesn't die, because it's indestructible. So you just gain infinity life and then do damage to your opponent or one of their creatures or whatever you want but mostly gaining infinite life is pretty good there is also the five mana dragon from Baldur's gate so in alchemy there's two playables that combo with this uh the creature was ill-tempered loner uh there's also 
something red dragon. I want to say like bashful red dragon, but that sounds super wrong. Is it brash red dragon? It's like be something. Wrathful, not brathful. <laughs> Combos built around four drop and five drop creatures that you essentially have to untap with are not typically good combos, and Ill Forgotten Loner and, to a lesser extent, Wrathful Red Dragon aren't necessarily super playable cards independently if you don't draw Take Up the Shield. Wrathful Red Dragon's slightly better, so maybe there is a combo deck in Alchemy. I don't think it's going to get there in Standard. They're just kind of too expensive and Take Up the Shield. Both halves of the combo just don't do enough without the other half of the combo. Oh, Wrathful can't target itself. Yeah, okay, never mind. Boring. Boring, not a combo at all. So, yeah, th that's there. It's cute. It's a hypothetical infinite combo that gains lots of life. It's probably not good, but as far as things to attempt to brew around go, it exists. Next up, Valiant Veteran. One and a white for a 2-2 creature core soldier. Other soldiers you control gain plus one, plus one. Three white white, exile valiant veteran from your graveyard, put a plus one plus one counter on each soldier you control. Okie dokie. So, soldier tribal combos with other valiant veterans. Each pumps gives you a mana sink in your graveyard. Not a good one. Although the fact that that three white white can be activated at instant speed is kind of nice. Gives you some flexibility about what you're bluffing. But... I mean, I certainly don't have any clue how many soldiers are actually in any particular format, and isn't a human, so isn't slotting into any kind of aggressive deck that's currently using Thalia's lieutenant. Uh, so I guess we'll keep track of what other cards get printed that synergize with this, but on its own, doesn't seem like there's quite enough from previous sets that come to mind. Cathar thingy that exiles as a soldier? Uh, Brutal Cathar? Maybe, but only on the front side, right? Because I think it would lose soldier when it becomes a werewolf. Or at the very least, they lose human. I don't know. Brutal Cathar. Let's take a look. Brutal Cathar. Human soldier werewolf transforms into just werewolf. Okay, that tracks. Hmm. That's not awful. For the time being, Anointed Peacekeeper, two and a white, three three creature human cleric with vigilance. As Anointed Peacekeeper enters the battlefield, look at an opponent's hand, then choose any card name. Spells your opponent's cast with the chosen name cost two more to cast. Activated abilities of sources with the chosen name cost two more to activate unless they're mana abilities. Interesting. This one's going to be constructed. Uh, I'll, like, bounce between formats when I see something to comment on in older formats, but yeah, standard generally is going to be most of what we're doing here, just because the majority of cards have more impact in standard than any other formats. So I guess we are actually losing Elite Spellbinder, and this basically just is Elite Spellbinder. Losing flying isn't really worth gaining too, or, yeah, isn't worth gaining too toughness. Vigilance is nice to have. I mean, the 3-3 three, three body isn't embarrassing, so that kind of works. Uh, Adeline is still in standard, so your 3-drop slot between Brutal Cathar and Adeline is still kind of as tight as ever. This just basically replaces the consideration for Elite Spellbinder, I think. As far as the ability goes, this is interesting to compare and contrast to Spellbinder, or I suppose more accurately, to weigh the pros and cons. This locks out multiple spells potentially, including spells they could top deck. But unlike Spellbinder, if they remove it in response to the ETB, then it never has successfully done anything. So basically this is weaker against instant speed slash control decks. Oh no, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on. You can't respond as an ETB because this isn't an ETB. It's a replacement effect that modifies how it enters the battlefield. So you actually get to look at their hand and name their instant speed removal before they can use the instant speed removal spell on Peacekeeper. Interesting. It does tax cycling, yes, because cycling is an activated ability. 
And yeah, that's a good point. I didn't actually consider that. It can tax things that are already on the board's activated abilities, which does mean planeswalkers. Uh, do we have any creature lands in standard now? Yeah, it's true. You can name cards that don't actually exist. I get the feeling that I'm probably going to miss a lot of the nuance to how this card plays before getting a bunch of practice with it. My initial guess is that this is probably has a stronger ability than Spellbinder, but has a weaker body for an aggressive deck. Does it hit a Ganjo and Boseju? Uh, it taxes the activated abilities on them, yes. It does not tax the ability for them to tap. Yeah, it's a lot like a Pything Needle in a way, except it also affects the spell actually being cast to begin with. Right, the ability is removed when Peacekeeper is removed. Dahlia is still in standard, yes. So, if they removal spell it's worse is what I was thinking originally, because my brain was programmed to think this was an ETB, but it isn't. It's specifically worded so that you choose the card as Anointed Peacekeeper enters the battlefield, which means it's part of the process of resolving Peacekeeper, which means that it the entire ability happens before they ever get priority to cast a removal spell. Yeah, so if they have a split of removal spells in hand and can kill the Peacekeeper with the cheaper removal spell, then the Peacekeeper will have not done anything. But that means that there would need to be two different playable removal spells and they would need to have both playable removal spells and the mana up to use them. So in those conditions, it winds up not being as good, but also a lot fewer things kill this than killed Spellbinder. Yeah, I dig it. I think this card's a cool design. I'm interested to see how my opinion of it changes over time in terms of how strong it is, because I, I do still think this is probably weaker than Spellbinder just because not having flying is a downside, but it's certainly a lot of stuff going on. Let's see, next up, these are all a bunch of limited cards. This has a bunch of text, so we'll take a look at it. Kicker makes a lot of cards that do very simple things, very complicated to look at. So my desire to just pick them up and start looking at them on stream without having actually fully read them might result in us looking at a lot of cards and then going, oh no, actually this isn't good at all. Anyway, Cleaving Skyrider, two and white, for a 2-2 creature human warrior with flash. Warrior, not soldier. Kicker, two and a red. Oh, flying. <laughs> I like how the flying is like the third line of text. When Cleaving Skyrider enters the battlefield, if it was kicked, it deals X damage to any target, which can be a player where X is the number of attacking creatures. Oh, weird. So you can flash this in when the opponent's attacking to deal damage to one of their creatures with the number of attacking creatures they have. I love this card from a design standpoint. Things that create... Being able to create so many divergent thought processes, doing so many different things and having so many different options for how to use the card in a design that doesn't have, like a huge amount of inherent complexity. He says, looking at the card that has flash and kicker and a keyword and an ability in addition to being a creature. It's pretty straightforward what it actually does. It's a lot of text, but functionally your brain grocks it pretty quickly. It, I love this kind of design for how much value and entertainment and depth it adds to a format for very little design complexity cost, I guess. I would say that in that regard, to me, it seems elegant, I guess would be like the best word to describe it. That said, the mana cost is like horrendously steep and it's unplayable outside of anything other than limited, but I do want to like gush about how cool I think that design is. What are the keywords for this format? Um, so far we have had kicker and enlist as set specific keywords. But we've also... Oh, and Domain. But I skipped over the one Domain card that we had. 
domain being do something equal to the number of basic land types among lands you control. But none of those have been playable yet. Would this be playable if the kicker was reduced by one generic? In the context of standard, no. If it was reduced by two generic, maybe it would be close. It still wouldn't even be, like, great if it cost only a single red to kick in the context of standard. The stat lines are just not super interesting. Have we seen any bangers yet? Um, only Anointed Peacekeeper, really, I think is the only banger. And even then, I'm not even sure if that's, like, actually going to see four of play. It's just good. Let's see, this is a saga, so we'll have to read it. Two and a white for Love Song of Night and Day. Read ahead. So, sagas are back. I believe all of the sagas have a new mechanic called Read Ahead that lets you choose which chapter to start on, meaning you can choose to get to the later chapters that are, generally speaking, higher impact sooner, but then you don't get the earlier chapters that might give you more value over time, which is an interesting sort of decision-making process. In this case, first mode, you and target opponent each draw two cards. Second mode, create a 1-1 one, one white bird creature token with flying. Third mode, put a plus one, plus one counter on each of up to two target creatures. So, sort of like getting a 3-3 three, three worth of stats for three mana but spread out over multiple turns. Hypothetically, two of it can be on a flyer. I have to imagine the majority of the time you would skip the first saga, or the first chapter. This certainly doesn't seem constructed playable. Might be limited playable-ish. I mean, weird things have happened with sagas and the way that enchantments that stick around and can potentially be sacrificed can provide value, but I can't think of any of those enablers currently. We don't have Yorian anymore, so that kind of makes sagas worse. Or it doesn't make sagas better, I suppose is the more accurate way to describe it. Uh, yeah, I'm not seeing this anywhere for me right now. Do 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 do. Next up, temporary lockdown. One white white enchantment. When temporary lockdown enters the battlefield, exile each non-land permanent with mana value two or less until temporary lockdown leaves the battlefield. This is a very interesting card to me. Mass portable hole. Hmm. Enchantment instead of artifact, for what that matters. It does also hit your own stuff. This is true. Yeah, so this is pretty good against aggro decks. It's pretty good in a scenario where you don't have one and two drops that you really care about. It's notable to me as a card that combos relatively well with Fateful Absence, since it cleans up all the clue tokens you gave your opponent. Yeah. Not a great card to pair with Treasures, but that also means it's actually kind of an interesting card against Fable of the Mirror Breaker. Doesn't hit the actual Fable, but potentially clears up treasure tokens that a Fable of the Mirror Breaker deck has left sitting around. This is definitely the kind of card that the playability is going to vary wildly depending on the meta. Like, that's kind of the defining aspect of all removal slash answer based cards, and this is a removal slash answer card. So its playability is determined largely by what kind of questions other decks are prone to asking, but I would be moderately surprised if we somehow wind up in a metagame where this card is not played. There would either need to just be way too much incidental enchantment destruction, or would just need to not be decks playing one and two drops, or would need to be way too many decks where this card is just dead, I guess. We'll see, but I'm excited about it. My brain looks at this card and goes, oh my goodness, I want to play this card against food so badly. But food already kind of got banned out of existence in every format. So I will say the thing that I am most happy about this is this card is amazing against red-black uh, Oni Colt Anvil. And I really dislike losing to Oni Colt Anvil. 
This clears out all the Oni Cult anvils. It clears out all of the random artifact tokens that are sitting around. And it clears out the uh, Meat Hook Massacre so that if they start rebuilding after you play Lockdown, they're not sitting around with a permanent play that randomly just pings you. Yeah, and Blood Tithe Harvester. Like, the entire Oni Cult Anvil deck dies to this thing. And do we have... No, the two-mana black removal spell that was capable of destroying enchantments, that was from Zendikar Rising, and that's rotating out. I'm assuming black will have some kind of, like, three-mana edict that destroys an enchantment in standard still. I mean, I guess there might be more black enchantment removal in this set that we haven't gotten to yet. Curious about what isn't rotating. Doesn't this just wreck historic auras as well? Uh... Yeah, although I don't know if Historic Auras has really been a deck. I don't know. Does... What happens if you temporary lock down a creature with a Kaya's Ghost Form on it? Got it. So if you exile Ghost Form and the creature that Ghost Form is on at the same time, Ghost Form still works. Got it. All right, that tracks. Blue-White Auras is a little less concerned about this because you can play the one mana phase out card and that beats temporary lockdown because it also phases out all the things that are enchanted onto the creature so you don't even hit those auras in addition to just playing Dovin's Veto and Spell Pierce but yeah so I don't actually think this is like super good against any of the auras decks but sometimes the auras deck doesn't have protection and you just want more removal and if you're playing this incidentally for other matchups then it's nice to have it's also very, very, very good against the um, various heroic decks in Pioneer. The white-red one especially tends to play a lot of one- and two-drop creatures, and the protection spells that it plays are typically based on protection from colors. And because Temporary Lockdown doesn't destroy or damage or target, it just gets all of their creatures which is great. Has anything impressed me? Uh, temporary Lockdown and the three drop Elite Spellbinder Replacement, Anointed Peacekeeper. Those two seem solid. Oh, yeah, Temporary Lockdown seems good. There are times I imagine where it won't see play, but for the most part, I think it's pretty good. Wouldn't a three mana do three damage sweeper be better against those decks? Against the heroic decks? Absolutely not. They're pretty good at giving their creatures protection from colors and also just of growing their creatures large enough to dodge damage-based removal. How am I ordering the cards? Uh, we're ordering the cards in set review order, so by color and then by mana cost within color. And I'm skipping cards that don't seem interesting. So next up, Archangel of Wrath. Two white white for a 3-4 creature angel. Kicker black and or kicker red. Flying and lifelink. When it enters the battlefield, if it was kicked, it deals 2 damage to any target. If it was kicked twice, it deals another 2 damage to any target. So, 4 mana, 3, 4 lifelinker. That, if you have additional mana, gets to deal pings to things with more lifelinking. It's interesting. I feel like this is mostly a card that's supposed to be a way to kind of win against tiny creature aggro decks, just gain a bunch of life, ping off multiple creatures, and then leave behind a well-statted blocker that can block flyers and gain more life over time. I could see building aggro decks that just, like, have three of this in the sideboard as a way to win aggro mirrors. Too expensive for anything other than standard, yeah, I would agree. I, I don't see this possibly being playable anywhere else. And sadly... Kicker does not synergize with Fable of the Mirror Breaker in what might be the only example of a mechanic that does not synergize with Fable of the Mirror Breaker, since if you copy Archangel of Wrath, the copy, you have to pay Kicker as you're casting, so you don't, like, get to ETB and trigger it more times. Sad. It does go to the opponent's face, yeah, so, like, hypothetically, if you're top-decking it and flooding out, you can just nug your opponent for four. Which... Siege Rhino that has one less of each stat for six mana is not, like, exciting, but 
again, if this is your top end in a deck that's like trying to go equivalent in a creature mirror, then that's fine. I guess <laughs> if you end up in an Archangel of Wrath mirror, it's interesting that for six mana, this kills the opponent's Archangel of Wrath. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's a neat design, but I don't think it's going to be, like, redefining anything particularly. Nor do I even think that it will necessarily be the best thing you can be doing in Creature Mirrors, just that it is an option. Boros Aggro on Standard gets more reach. Yeah, I don't know that, like, Boros Aggro actually wants this, because as a 4-drop, it's pretty underwhelming, and your opponent has to be playing creatures for this to be good. Like... The rate on this card is not good if your intention is to throw the damage at the opponent's face. If you want to be casting burn spells at your opponent's face, this is a bad burn spell. Not efficient. But as far as, like, post-board resource attrition wars that you need to sideboard into after you got paired into an aggro mirror, that seems like where this card has a niche. Definitely worse than Raiju, but potentially better than Raiju in a mirror match is where I would rate this card overall. Let's see. That's nothing, that's nothing, that's nothing. This is hypothetically something. Prayer of Binding, three and a white for an enchantment with flash. When Prayer of Binding enters the battlefield, exile up to one target non-land permanent and demonic controls until Prayer of Binding leaves the battlefield, you gain two life. So, this seems pretty terrible. We have had four mana O-rings in the past, with Flash. They have never been playable. The previous one had cycling for a single white. This one gains two life instead. Cast out. Yeah, that's the one. That's the one. I was of the opinion that cast out was like heinously garbage unplayable and didn't deserve to be in any decks. And I'm probably going to wind up being of the same opinion of Prayer Binding, unless this is a much slower format with much fewer things that are relevant to the turn they enter the battlefield. People will probably still try playing it because for some reason they thought Cast Out was good, but four mana is a lot of mana to pay for a removal that doesn't even, like, answer something on the stack. I don't like my opponent actually getting to resolve their Planeswalker ability before I kill their Planeswalker. Not for me. Sarah Paragon. Two white white for a 3-4 creature angel. Flying. Once during each of your turns, you may play a land from your graveyard or cast a permanent spell from with mana value 3 or less from your graveyard. If you do, it gains when this permanent is put into a graveyard from the battlefield. Exile it and you gain 2 life. Uh... Huh... I mean, this seems really cool with fetch lands in formats that are mostly too old for that to be relevant. Like, this is not modern playable, I don't think. I mean, I don't know, maybe it is. Modern's weird. Four mana is infinity mana, but it is almost Luris. Does it work with multiples? Um... Yes. If you have two Sarah Paragons in play, you can play two spells. Or multiple land drops. Each effect is used a specific time. So it is a card that combos pretty well with Fable, in that it also lets you cast Fable from your graveyard. Mm. I don't know if having two of these in play should mean that you just win the game, necessarily. All it lets you do is just cast permanence from your graveyard. I mean, it, Fable of the Mirror Breaker is definitely the card that this makes the most sense with, because Fable of the Mirror Breaker is a reason to have a bunch of things in your graveyard in the first place, and copying the Sarah Paragon works well, and it gives you mana to play Paragon and do other stuff the turn that it comes into play. Which... Fine... Yeah, notably, you can play the same Fable over and over and over. I, I guess the problem I have with it is that this card is, like, closer to a 6-drop or a 7-drop than it is to a 4-drop, and the stats are really underwhelming for it at that point. 
it's weak to instant speed removal? It's not necessarily, because you can play it and then cast another spell before they can remove it. Fable will get exiled when it goes to the graveyard the second time. It should not be the case, I don't think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fable, when it flips to chapter three, doesn't just flip. It leaves the battlefield and then comes back, so it removes the rider on it. I, I guess... My brain is kind of interested with this card and the Streets of New Capenna Evolving Wilds that gain life. That's probably really bad, but it's cute that you can play one of those from your graveyard and immediately gain three life in addition to making a land drop. And you just get to do that every turn with one of these, even if you have no other per things in your graveyard. But then you have to be playing slow Evolving Wilds in your deck. I mean, I've played Evolving Wilds before, so, like, that's legal. You can do that, but I, I'm still just really uncertain about the fact that on turn four, and this is occupying a four-drop slot in your deck, a four-mana three-four flyer that does nothing else is not interesting, and then it might just die. Could be interesting with Field of Ruin. That's true. We don't have Field of Ruin in Standard, though, and I'm not... Or I'm pretty sure we don't have Field of Ruin in Standard. Correct me if I'm wrong on that. But I'm also not, like, hyper... into this card in, like, Pioneer, really. Do we have Field of Ruin? Oh, you know what? We might. Yeah, we do. Okay, we do have Field of Ruin in Midnight Hunt. Yeah, that's sort of interesting. That takes a lot more mana, though. It's like, one of the things that's kind of cool about Sarah Paragon is if you have four lands, and you've tapped out at four lands, then on, like, turn five, you can play the Paragon and play the land drop from your graveyard immediately and gain the life immediately, whereas Field of Ruin requires you to invest two mana on a future turn before you gain the life. But, yeah, again, then you're putting tap lands in your deck, and that's just awfully sketchy. But, yeah... Restoration of a Ganjo is also an engine. Yeah, I mean, you can definitely build decks around this card, planning for it to be an engine. I'm just uncertain whether or not the engine is likely to be strong enough. But yeah, it's worth exploring. Definitely, definitely worth exploring. Next up, Donatha Banalia's Hope. Four and a white for a 4-4 legendary creature, Human Knight. First Strike, Vigilance, Lifelink. When Danatha Benalia's Hope enters the battlefield, you may put an aura or equipment card from your hand or graveyard onto the battlefield attached to Danatha. Uh, so the ideal is that you put it from your graveyard, so that this is card advantage, and then it's got First Strike, Vigilance, and Lifelink. I mean, the stat lines are good enough for limited. Five mana, that seems like probably way too much for constructed. Regrettably. Yeah, that's true. Danatha, I suppose, does work with the equipment creatures from Streets of New Capenna. But even then, five mana's a lot of mana. A lot of mana, especially for decks that want to be playing those equipment creatures that, by and large, were aggressive. I suppose, as far as the exception to being aggressive goes, this is potentially interesting with Reality Chip. Neo? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Neo. Not Streets of Nukapena. I was picturing the correct aesthetic in my head. Just didn't say the right words. Oopsie-weepsies. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think I ultimately expect much from this at this mana cost. Defiler of Faith. Three white white for a 5-5 five, five creature Phyrexian human. Has Vigilance. As an additional cost to cast white permanent spells, you may pay two life. Those spells cost one white mana less to cast if you paid life this way. This effect reduces only, amount of, only the amount of white mana you pay. Whenever you cast a white permanent spell, create a 1-1 one, one white soldier creature token. Uh, like, sure, hypothetically, I see what you're trying to do. But I don't think this effect is worth a 5-mana five 5-5 five, five Vigilance. That seems... Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can only pay a... Si you can only discount spells by a single white off of a single Defiler. 
if you have two defilers, you could knock off two white. But, yeah, this... This just doesn't feel like it does enough to be worth spending five mana on to me. Just kind of underwhelming. Next up, Urza assembles the Titans. Three white, white. Oh. Socks, how come you have so much hair? It gets all over the place. Sooner or later, it's going to be winter, and then I won't be sweaty, and then all your hair won't stick to me quite as much. He says, pretending that his room isn't incredibly hot, even in the middle of summer. Or even in the middle of winter. On account of the computer constantly running. So, Urza assembles the Titan. Three white white. Read ahead. First chapter. Scry four, then you may reveal the top card of your library. If it's a Planeswalker card, if a Planeswalker card is revealed this way, put it into your hand. Second chapter. You may put a Planeswalker card with mana value six or less from your hand onto the battlefield. Three, you may activate the loyalty abilities of Planeswalkers you control twice this turn rather than only once. Huh. So... Scry four, then draw a card if you found a Planeswalker in the top five is pretty strong. I mean, not necessarily super strong, but it's not useless. Then... You get to put a Planeswalker into play. You can skip ahead to putting the Planeswalker into play, which mostly just means you get to put a six-drop Planeswalker into play if you choose to skip ahead for five mana, which is kind of like a ritual. And then you get to activate loyalty abilities twice. That's unclear. Yeah, so I guess part of the idea is that you could put a Planeswalker into play after you untapped but that requires you to, like, play a certain density of Planeswalkers in your deck to begin with, which is a deck-building cost in a lot of formats. How many Planeswalkers do you need for this to consistently hit one? I mean, I would say, like, seven, probably? Is this good with Wandering Emperor? Can that count? I don't know. Do we have any powerful six-mana Planeswalkers? Uh, I, I don't know. I, I gotta imagine this changes contextually based on what kind of Planeswalkers we have access to in the formats. More than 15. So you, you don't need this card to draw a Planeswalker reliably. It's totally fine if the first chapter just whiffs and doesn't get a Planeswalker especially if you already have the Planeswalker in hand. If the first chapter of this is just normal Scry 4, then that's fine. If you're taking advantage of, all right, well, I'm going to put a Planeswalker into play on a turn where I have a bunch of mana up so that you can protect it, that's, that's something that has some utility and then you get to activate a Planeswalker twice. Is that worth a card? I don't know, but Scry 4 is not worth 5 mana or a card, but it's close to replacing the value of the card. Just takes time, but... I don't see the Planeswalkers in existence currently that would make me excited to play this for the second chapter, and I think basically... Whether this card is playable or not is determined by whether the second chapter has a niche. Blue-white super friends with Narset, Teferi, and Wandering Emperor can work. Yeah, but then you're like playing Teferi and Wandering Emperor, and I don't think either of those cards really synergizes with Urza Assembles the Titans. Like, neither of them is super powerful to put into play at sorcery speed off of the second chapter. Can't imagine this is good. I, so... It's an interesting card to think of for the future, because we have had powerful six-mana Planeswalkers in the past that I think this would have been good with. The uh, Shadows of Ernestrad six-mana Sorin comes to mind. War of the Spark Liliana comes to mind. Strixhaven Liliana comes to mind, although less so than the other twos. Like, that's interesting but yeah we definitely don't have some right now that i can think of 
Yeah, Strix Lily isn't super impressive, but it, it's more impressive than what I can think of off standard. Playing Tommy off, this means she ults the next turn, I guess. But we're playing a really dirtily deck that involves a lot of cards that don't do anything at that point. Why wouldn't you just cast those things on six mana? feel like you wouldn't really wouldn't use the mana. So the idea is supposed to be that if you play a six mana Planeswalker, it has to do a lot to protect itself so that they don't just kill the six mana Planeswalker with their board. But if you put a six mana Planeswalker into play using this ability while you have mana up, then it becomes much easier for the Planeswalker to like accrue value or uptick or do something that isn't dedicating, dedicated to protecting itself because you can protect it with your available mana. So, that's the theory. You could just play a board wipe on that turn. Whereas if you play a board wipe on turn five and then play the six mana Planeswalker on turn six, well, they've got an entire turn to have played more creatures to the board to continue pressuring your Planeswalkers. Take, for example, the classic of you play five mana to fairy, they cycle a Shark Typhoon and punch your Teferi. Teferi at least has the benefit of getting card advantage while untapping mana to protect itself, but, like, that's what you're trying to play around, more or less. Yeah. I even... I want to like the card, but I definitely do not expect this card to be good. I just think it has potential to be fine. <laughs> Next up, Leyline Binding. Five and a white for an enchantment with flash domain. This spell costs one less to cast for each basic land type among lands you control. When Leyline Binding enters the battlefield, exile target non-land permanent an opponent controls until Leyline Binding leaves the battlefield. Fascinating that we got two cast outs in the same set. So the majority of the value of this card comes from fetch land formats, where like on turn two you can turn one, fetch a triome that makes white mana tapped. Turn to go and fetch a Shockland or another Triome that just immediately gets you to the full domain. And then this costs one mana. And once this costs one or two mana, it's an actively good card. We do have Trylands in standard, yes. I don't know how... Not necessarily... Reliable isn't necessarily the right word. I don't know how consistently you can get this down to one or two mana in standard and still have, like, a solid mana base. Yeah, if you find a Triome, you can get this down to three. We have played Kami War, but most of the decks where we played Kami War were actually not about playing a bunch of Triomes, because playing a ton of tap lands does make your life sort of awkward. Uh, I mean... I could definitely see this being entirely reasonable in a four-color deck. I lack the context to know whether that's worthwhile, because ultimately this is a card that only ever is a one-for-one. One. It just becomes a very efficient one-for-one one over time. Yeah, yeah, I think this card is absolutely stellar in any format with fetch lands. Not 100% of decks will want it, but a lot of decks want to have access to a pseudo-weird version of Fatal Push. But I have no clue if the mana bases in any non-fetch land format are constructible at a rate where the costs of the mana base don't exceed the benefit that you're getting out of Domain. Would I play this over March in Esper or Jeskai? Uh, in Historic or Pioneer? No, but I don't know that I would play March in either of those decks either. Both of those decks have access to better two-mana removal that's consistently two-mana removal, and they're in formats where the presence of combo decks that require you to actually be able to play removal on turns like one through three reliably just kind of make this not acceptable. Probably good in Explorer Omnath. Uh... I don't think so, because Explorer Omnath is generally an adventures deck, and that's a really tight list. Doesn't really have room to play more removal. Yeah, I don't know. I'll be interested to see where this gets to in Standard through Pioneer and all the various arena formats.
Interesting card. Let's see, moving on to blue next. 